Welcome to everybody. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, this is another one of our uh, seminars forming part of our uh, ongoing series of seminars for the um, Theoretical Physics Group of the Australian Institute of Physics. I'm Dave Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at the Australian National University, and I'm hosting this series of talks on behalf of the group. Um, over the last few months, we've had talks on a range of interesting topics. I'll just mention them to remind you and um, let you know where you can catch up if you want to see those on the YouTube channel. Uh, we've had talks on, uh, for example, nuclear um, uh, computation given by Professor Shiala Shanahan from the Center for Theoretical Physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We had a fascinating talk from Peter Drummond from Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, who was talking about uh, validating important quantum algorithms for quantum computing. Jaden Newstead gave us a talk uh, from the University of Melbourne on the detection of dark matter. And most recently, we heard from Professor York Frodner from the University of Otago on an approach to the understanding of scattering of gravitational waves from a geometric perspective. That was another very good talk. So all of these talks are uh, available to watch again if you miss them on the YouTube channel uh, associated with the uh, Theoretical Physics Group, as this talk will be as well, should be up in a few days. Um, if you're interested in theoretical physics and you'd like to keep up to date with developments happening in theoretical physics in Australia, you're very welcome to join the group, of course. Um, there is a link provided for that purpose uh, in the um, in the notice for this talk. I noticed that Murray put that in there. That should make it easy to navigate there. So today's talk is by um, Professor Shada Epek. Shada hails from the theoretical uh, particle physics group at uh, Carlton University in Ottawa, where she works on a range of topics in theoretical particle physics related to things like the nature of dark matter, the origin of neutrino mass, and most relevantly and to this talk, the matter-antimatter asymmetry problem. Uh, sometimes in these talks, it can be a bit difficult to co coordinate in real-time questions. So um, if particularly if there's some sort of internet delay, which can sometimes occur. So if you have any questions for Shader, please just go ahead and type them in the Q&A panel at the top and we'll answer them at the, at the bottom at the end of the talk, if that's okay. So as we all probably know, we've all heard about the matter antimatter symmetry problem, um, sometimes called the baryon asymmetry. It's the preponderance of overwhelming preponderance, we should say, of matter over dark matter in the observable universe. And it's regarded as a problem by the vast majority of physicists because although physics most relevantly to this talk, the standard model of particle physics does allow for some asymmetries of nature, such as CP violations or the chirality of the weak interaction, the amount of asymmetry, as I understand it, that appears to be able to be produced or explained by that mechanism is far too small to explain why half the universe appears to be missing if we can put it in those terms. So as you would have seen from Shader's abstract, um, the uh, this problem has inspired a, a number of interesting and creative physical models, uh, including the hypothesis of particle-antiparticle oscillations uh, in the early universe. So I'm looking forward to this. I think it's going to be a fascinating talk, and it's a great opportunity to introduce Shader with her talk entitled, Why Are We Here? Matter-Antimatter Asymmetry of the Universe. Over to you, please, Jada. Thank you very much for the uh, lovely introduction. Yeah, so I titled my talk, uh, Why Are We Here? And uh, my hope is that you are not here only because you were forced to, and you, uh, but you're here because you wanted to listen to, listen to, listen to my talk. So thanks for coming. So before, um, before, to kind of discussing why we are here or how we are here. Let's think about how we got here. This is basically a, a very, very brief history of our universe as it expands from the very beginning. So we think that you know, our universe started maybe with a big bang, followed by an era of inflation where the universe was expanding exponentially. And then at some point inflation might have ended it is very reasonable to believe that when the inflation ended, our universe was very hot. 
And after that, our universe continues to expand and as, exp and as it expands, it cools down. And there are many uh, special eras in the very early universe. This is when, we, when I say early universe, I'm usually thinking about when the universe was maybe a, a minute old or even younger and up to maybe um, the, the CMB era. So as the universe uh, gets older, but still very, very young, there's a, there's a few, there are a few things happen. For example, when the universe's temperature is about 100 GV, the electroweak symmetry breaks and then uh, standard model particles acquire masses. When the universe cools down to about a temperature of one uh, MeV, uh, nuclei, protons and neutrons start binding into like nuclei, like deuterium, helium, helium-4, helium-3, and even lithium. This is a very important era as well called the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which will come up in my talk in a few slides. And then again, as uh, still the universe expands and cools down at around 3000 Kelvin temperature, electrons um, bind into the nuclei forming, uh, forming neutral atoms and the universe becomes neutral for the photons to escape. And then this, you know, this, these photons we observe as the cosmic microwave background. And right now our universe is about 13.8 billion years old and we are all here talking about physics. The one thing we know about our universe is that um, even though there could have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter before this BBN era, before about one MeV temperature, we for sure know that BBN happened with basically no antimatter around. Again, this uh, this observation will come up in a few slides, but this is why I put, I put the BBN, uh, BBN line here importantly. And another thing we know about our universe is the energy density of our universe, and this you know this can be measured from uh, a few in a, in a few different ways. Um, one of the best ways is through the cosmic microwave background, and through these measurements we know that our universe is about seventy percent uh, is about seventy percent dark energy. Dark energy is you know why our universe's expansion is accelerating now, and it's about twenty five percent dark matter and only 5% um, ordinary matter, or what we call ordinary matter. Ordinary matter is uh, what is basically in the standard model, like electrons, uh, quarks, photons, uh, bosons, uh, other, other gauge carrying bosons, um, and, and neutrinos. The, so we, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that we don't know about our universe. We definitely don't know what dark energy is. We also don't know what dark matter is. And you already listened to your great talks about dark matter. Uh, we have theories, but we don't quite know what it is. And we know a lot about ordinary matter, but there's still stuff that we don't know about ordinary matter. And this talk is actually going to be about ordinary matter and the problems with ordinary matter. So one thing we definitely know about uh, about the standard model particles is that when a particle and an antiparticle comes close to each other, they annihilate and they annihilate into you know into stuff. But uh, at the end, they will probably turn into pure energy. So you know this we this is from our uh, you know nice theory of standard model, but also from experiments as well. So that means that if there was any anti, uh, you know, an anti Sheda here or uh, anti you in the same room as you, you will probably be become uh, get close enough that you will annihilate each other. So this is really the answer to to my question in my title slide is that why we are here is because there is no antimatter because if there was any antimatter, we definitely would not be would not be here. But you know what is this? What is this asymmetry or or this this mismatch of you know not having any antimatter around is called is called the matter antimatter asymmetry, and we can actually quantify this asymmetry in um, in um, by two two observations. So one observation comes from the cosmic microwave background. So first of all, the asymmetry is quantified through this quantity eta. Eta is the ratio of number density of baryons minus number density of antibaryons over number density of photons. You might also sometimes see this ratio as uh, number density of baryons over the entropy density. And entropy density is uh, very close to the number density, uh, number density of photons in the universe. 
<laughs> and when I say baryon, you know, I'm just I, I'm mostly thinking about protons and neutrons. So this asymmetry can be measured actually from the cosmic, cosmic microwave background. This is a picture of the cosmic microwave background um, uh, observed by the Planck satellite in 2015, and the of course, the, 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 red, the red regions here are where the photons are a bit uh, hotter and the blue regions are hot, photons are a bit, uh, a bit colder. But overall, the cosmic microwave background temperature is about 2.7 Kelvin um, right now. The correlations between the hotter and colder regions, they depend on many things, but they also depend on the spiral to photon ratio or the baryon asymmetry of our universe. And what we observe from the cosmic microwave background is that this quantity eta is about six times 10 to the minus 10. And another, another era that we can measure the baryon asymmetry is actually much earlier. So this is in the era of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Again, Big Bang, Big Bang nucleosynthesis is when uh, proton and neutrons start binding to start binding to form light nuclei. And this starts at a temperature of 10 MeV or so, or uh, a few MeV, and it goes on for, uh, for a bit. But um, but the first ones start forming around a few MeV temperatures, and you know, the the uh, you form deuteron, and then you form helium three, helium four, and then you can build your way up to lithium seven and even beryllium eight. The plot you are seeing here is um, is on the y-axis are uh, abundances of these primordial light elements. So the first one, the, the one on the top is the helium-4, and then deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7. And on the x-axis is the same quantity, eta. Uh, this is, yes, eta in um, the baryon to photon ratio. The, the lines on this plot are theoretical expectations. So it's basically given some eta, how much helium you expect to have in the early universe coming from BBN, or how much deuterium you expect to, you expect to have, again, produced at BBN. And the, the yellow bars are observations of these primordial, primordial elements. You see, uh, it might be a bit hard to see the deuterium observation because the very, very thin silver of a yellow bar, deuterium is very well observed. And you also see, um, um, you also see that in the, the as a vertical bar, the CMB, CMB value of eta. This is six times ten to the minus ten. You see, uh, you see a few things here. The first one is that deuterium uh, primordial deuterium abundance agrees very well with the CMB measurement of eta. Uh, the prediction uh, for the deuterium abundance agrees very well with the CMB prediction and uh, that there's a mismatch between the lithium lit observations of lithium abundance and what is observed from, uh, what is observed from CMB uh, for eta. The lithium abundance might have gone away already and it was disputed for a long time. Uh, so we will take the six times 10 to the minus 10 number as a given. The helium, the helium measurement is not as good uh, there, are a lot, there are large error bars because helium is helium four is um, is um, produced a lot in stars, so it is hard to disentangle what is primordial, like what is from BBN and what is young helium four, basically. Whereas deuterium, you only burn deuterium in stars, so whatever you observe is definitely coming from the primordial era. That's why the deuterium abundance measurements are are much um, uh, much stronger. So, but overall, the this quantity eta is uh, about ten to the minus ten, and this number corresponds to basically having one extra quark uh, for every ten billion quark and two quark pairs. So, if you have this in the very early universe, the symmetric part of this, uh, the quarks and antiquarks, they will annihilate, and then you will end up with uh, with an extra quark, basically. And um, but how do you how do you come up with an extra quark, right? So this is basically the question: How do you produce this asymmetry? Uh, is like how do you come up come up with a situation where you have one extra quark in the in the early universe? In order to do that, or in order to have a particle physics model that will give you extra extra particles over antiparticles, you need to your particle physics model needs to satisfy uh, three different uh, three uh, three necessary conditions. These are called Sakharov conditions, and uh, after physicist Andrei Sakharov. 
this, these were laid out in 19, in a paper in 1967. And these conditions are your physics model, new physics model, or sorry, your part particle physics model needs to violate baryon number. So baryon number cannot be a conserved quantity. Your particle physics uh, model also needs to violate charge and charge parity symmetries, and you need to have some out of equilibrium process. And in terms of physics, this kind of makes sense because, uh, for example, the first one, if you if you assume that after inflation there were equal amounts of uh, matter and antimatter, and this is a very good assumption because inflation usually inflates away all um, all anomalies. Uh, so if you start with an equal numbers of uh, baryons and antibaryons, and if the baryon number is a conserved quantity, you will always end up with you know, equal numbers of baryons and antibaryons, basically. So, you know, in order to produce some extra baryons over antibaryons, you need to, you need the baryon number to not be a conserved quantity. And charge and uh, charge parity symmetry is a way to tell the difference between particles and antiparticles, right? Or left-handed particles and right-handed antiparticles. So again, your new physics model needs to have a way of knowing what is the left-handed particle and what's the right-handed particle. And this only happens if your if your Lagrangian is aware that CP is violated, or your Lagrangian does not have CP as a symmetry. And the out of equilibrium condition is also kind of intuitive because if you have a process that happens one way and is in equilibrium, that means that the reverse process also happens with the exact same rate. So, for example, if you have a process that produces baryons, you will also have a process that eats or annihilates baryons with the same rate. So, in thermal equilibrium, you will never produce a baryon asymmetry. You will always have equal equal rates of creating and and erasing baryons. So you need to be some out of equilibrium so that you only have a process that goes one way, but the other process is, is not available to you. When you have these conditions uh, that you need to satisfy to produce a matter antimatter asymmetry, the first question you can you can say, or the first thing that comes to mind is that, oh, we already have a great particle physics model. It's called the standard model. Can the standard model satisfy these conditions and explain the baryon asymmetry? The first condition is actually very efficiently satisfied in the standard model. Baryon number is violated in weak interactions. It's, it's a conserved quantity in, at the Lagrangian level, but it is violated through uh, what is uh, anomalously. And that's because only left-handed particles interact via the nuclear force. So this creates an anomalous uh, anomalous baryon current, or actually a B plus uh, B plus L current, baryon plus lepton number current, and this can be calculated through. Um, you can see here what the what the current is, the baryon current or the lepton current. This is is related to the W W dual, where W is the weak field strength. And the baryon estimate you will get is the the integral of this current. Uh, which is integral of this term. This gives you a churn Simons, uh, churn Simons, uh, it gives you a churn Simons term. More qualitatively, what, uh, what you can think is that our universe is kind of inside a, a, a cosine potential. And don't worry about where this potential comes from, but the, the physics qualitatively uh, checks out. So this potential depends on this baryon number. So this is a net baryon number. And you know, at, at zero temperature, you are stuck in one of these minima. So you could be, you know, you could be at zero, one, or two in integer steps, but you are stuck there. You will never change your baryon number at zero temperature because at zero temperature, the only way you can you can change your baryon number are through instanton effects, and instantons are exponentially suppressed. For this scenario, the instanton rate goes like, oops, sorry, goes like e to the minus four pi over the weak coupling constant, and that's a number like e to the minus 160. So it will never happen. So we are stuck with the, the baryon that number that we have. Our baryon number right now will not change because we are at very small, very low temperatures. However, at higher temperatures, our universe could be, or the, you know, we stuck inside our universe, doesn't have to be at a minima. It could have. It could be closer to a maxima of this potential, and then instead of tunneling, you can just roll over. 
These rolling over processes called, are called Spaleron processes, and they are very active at temperatures above the electroweak scale. So this is the, when, the, uh, when the universe is above 150 GeV or so, these kind of processes are very active, very efficient, and their rate goes like uh, alpha weak to the fifth times T to, T to the four. So T to the four is just a, like an equilibrium process, basically. So even though our universe with the standard model right now is not violating baryon number in the very early universe, it was very efficient at violating baryon number. We also know that standard model has, um, has CP violation through, we, through the CKM phase. This is, the, uh, this is, um, this is also because uh, standard model is a chiral theory and the weak interactions can tell the difference between a left again a left-handed particle and a right-handed antiparticle, and uh, phenomenologically this comes up as a mismatch in the quark sector. So quark uh, quark uh, quark states actually mis mix with each other, and this mixing uh, matrix is called the CKM mix mixing matrix, and it has three mixing angles and one phase, and that phase or irreducible phase, and that phase uh, causes CP violation. We observed CP violation, of course, we observed CP violation in many states, but it was um, it was discovered in K long decays in 2012. So this is K long um, K long decays to both a two pion state and a three pion state. Uh, and two pion state is CP even, three pion state is CP odd. So CP is definitely violated. And again, this violation comes through the com a complex phase in the CKM matrix. So this is great because you need CP violation for. Uh, for generating the Bayon asymmetry. But turns out the CP violation in the standard model, even though it's not small, it's actually a, a, a large CP phase, uh, is great. We should definitely have it, but it's actually not nearly enough to generate the observed Bayon asymmetry in the universe. So the calculations that go into uh, this prediction is quite, uh, quite complicated. But uh, but the hand wavy way to kind of hand wavy way to quantize how much asymmetry you will get from the CP phase is shown in here purplish. So this, the eta you expect is proportional to uh, this J the Yaskol, what's called the Yaskol parameter, is a reparameterization invariant quantity uh, for the CKM uh, for the CKM um, CKM phase times the quark masses over the weak scale mass or quark masses over the, the W mass basically. So this is a very, again, a very hand wavy, very, very hand wavy prediction. But if you do a much more detailed calculation for how much baryon asymmetry you can get from just the, the standard model CP phase in the CKM matrix, the prediction is about 10 to the minus 20. And the observation is 10 to the minus 10. So this is 10 orders of magnitude smaller already. And this is already assuming other things about the standard model, which I will um, talk in the next slide. So this is just the quark sector, the CKM phase. One can also ask the standard model has another mixing matrix in the neutrino sector that's called the PMNS, uh, PMNS matrix. And in the PMNS matrix, that could also be a CP violating phase. How about that? How about that, that phase that uh, can we can we include that in Bayon number violation or lepton number violation? That is quite complicated. And I'm oh, sorry, that's actually harder to, to uh, include in generational brain asymmetry. Also, we haven't observed that CP violation yet. So, and hopefully uh, Dune and Hyper-K will definitely tell if there's CP violation in the lepton sector, in the neutrino sector or not. So the third condition of uh, going out of equilibrium Standard model, so you know, the, the gist of this previous slide is that standard model has CP violation, but nearly not enough for generating the generating the, the observed baryon asymmetry. And the third condition is going out of equilibrium. So when we say out of equilibrium in the early universe, we mean um, what we mean is that rate of some interaction is smaller than the, the rate of the expansion rate of the universe. This is very similar, you know, we do this for dark matter as well, for example, if the dark matter particles can annihilate, but as the universe expands, they, it becomes harder and harder for them to find each other so that they will stop as the annihilations freeze out at some point. This could happen, for example, weak interactions or electromagnetic interactions as well. 
So what you do is for any given process, you can compare the rate of that process to the, to the Hubble rate. In the standard model, in the early, well, for the standard model in the early universe, there's really nothing that goes out of equilibrium at the temperature that you, you want them to go out, basically. Even weak interactions are, uh, are much faster, much faster than the expansion rate of the universe. So standard model universe is, has always equilibrates, unfortunately. One, well, maybe, or fortunately for, uh, for my research, because I am a beyond the standard model physicist. One other possibility uh, for an out of equilibrium process is a cosmological phase transition. If a phase transition is first order, uh, a first order phase transition is a very out of equilibrium process. And there was, um, there was thinking that before we measured the Higgs mass, or before we knew the, 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 um, the size of the Higgs mass, there was a probability that the standard model electroweak transition would be a first order phase transition. And first order phase transitions happen via what are called bubble nucleations, which are very, very uh, violent and out of out of equilibrium processes. Unfortunately, and also they're they're fantastic. If you want to talk about phase and cosmological phase transitions, we can talk about that too. But unfortunately, for our standard model. The electric transition is would it be in a first order phase transition if the Higgs was lighter? As long as the Higgs is heavier than about 75 GeV or so, the transition is a crossover, and a crossover transition is happens always in equilibrium. So unfortunately, the electric transition is also not first order uh, or not out of equilibrium. So really, standard model does not have any out of equilibrium processes. So if we are thinking about um, if we are thinking about new physics models, a particle physics model that will explain the explain the Baryon asymmetry or that will generate a Baryon asymmetry, we definitely need some new physics, which probably where well, there's particle number, like Baryon number or lepton number, you could also use the standard model Baryon number violation. That's also fine, but you definitely need extra CP violation and some out of equilibrium process, which doesn't exist in the standard model. And of course, you want this new physics model to also interact with the standard model because at the end, you want to produce standard model baryons. You want to produce our, our, our protons and neutrons and electrons, basically. So the Baryonist method of the universe is really a very, very strong a uh, strong reason why we need some new physics. It's like definitely not answered in standard model and it's new physics that definitely interacts with the standard model, which is not always true for dark matter because dark matter doesn't necessarily need to interact with the standard model. There are many directions for new physics and there are many categories of models that try to address this question. For example, um, you, when you think about the Higgs sector, so as I said, our electric transition is not a first order transition because Higgs is kind of heavy, but in, as long as, or as soon as you add extra scalar fields in the standard model, it is quite easy to get a first order phase transition. This exists in uh, two doublet models, NMSSM, MSSM, or even just adding an extra singlet scalar to the standard model, you can easily get a first order phase transition. Also, in these extended scalar sectors, you could have extra CP violation, which you know, which the, which will let you to um, to satisfy Sakharov conditions easily. You could also have uh, models um, called lactogenesis models. These have heavy right-handed neutrinos. The heavy right handed neutrinos are introduced to explain why neutrinos are massive, but also they can decay out of equilibrium. And I will come to uh, decaying out of equilibrium in a bit. They can also have CP violation, which can interfere um, from, uh, from interference between three level and loop level processes. It's a bit suppressed and, and um, harder to get the CP violation, but this can be done. And there are many many nice lepidogenesis model. You can also try to combine two shortcomings of the standard model. Um, as I said, you also don't know what dark matter is. So you can say, ah, we don't know what dark matter is. If dark matter resides in some dark sector with its own asymmetry, maybe that explains the asymmetry in our visible sector as well. And there are many other, uh, many other types of models. These are just uh, the most common, most common ones, I will say. So, before I go to um, the the new physics model that I uh, I enjoy because I uh, I worked on it a lot, I actually will I will revisit the CP relation in the standard model just um, briefly. 
So CP validation in the standard model, uh, as I said, was discovered in the in the uh, in Kaon the case, and Kaons and other neutral mesons are fascinating systems. Uh, they go under a process called meson anti meson oscillations. So for Kaons, uh, the S bar uh, K Kaon is a DS bar state, and an anti Kaon is an SD bar state, and they can oscillate between K and K bar states to uh, through weak interactions through uh, box diagrams like this. And this happens for B mesons and D mesons as well. And we observed all these oscillations here. Um, yes, we observed the D meson oscillations um, as well. And we also observed CP relation in, uh, in, in these oscillating systems too. I actually, I don't think we observe CP relation in the D meson system yet, but that shouldn't, there is no reason why it shouldn't be there. So the particle antiparticles, so these systems that you know gave us nice CP evaluating observables, they also go under these uh, these oscillations, meson anti meson oscillations. So this got me quite interested, thinking, oh, maybe particle antiparticle oscillations are special for CP evaluation. They have some, they have like nice special environment, and oscillations are are uh, are fun and very um, uh, described by like very easy quantum mechanical physics, basically. So in 2016, I was thinking of how to get these oscillations, uh, how to use these uh, particle antiparticle oscillations to generate uh, the baryon asymmetry. And um, with my collaborator, John Marsh-Russell, we basically started from a very, very, very basic model, like simple model, the most very general uh, simple model. We decided to use a direct fermion, well, actually a pseudo direct fermion. So take some direct fermion with an approximately broken global U1. The mass terms you can write are the direct mass, of course, for this fermion. And since, the, since you have a broken U1 charge, uh, you can also write a Majorana mass, and you expect the Majorana mass to be small if the, the global symmetry is only approximately broken. In this case, this fermion is called a pseudo Dirac fermion. So it's not completely Dirac or Majorana, but pseudo Dirac. And uh, in, in this simple effective model, we can also include some interactions for both the, the fermion state and the antifermion state. So the psi is the fermion state and psi c is the charge conjugate antifermion state. And g1 and g2 are some coupling constant and here x, y are some final states. Then they don't have to be a two particles final state. Actually, they will be a, a three quark state for our more specific model. But x, y is just some final state that will carry either baryon number or lepton number. Okay, so again, if you want to think more concretely, you can just put a UDD here for a baryon, num uh, baryon number one state. <clears throat> the Hamiltonian for the state is just this. So this M is the, the mass matrix. Uh, this is in the psi psi C basis. And then gamma describes the decays of these fermions. And um, here, this parameter R is um, the G, G2 over G1, so this is, oh, sorry, the coupling constants between these fermions and the final states, or um, that will allow for decays. And this phi gamma is the phase between, the phase difference between G1 and G2. So in order to have CP relation, we already know that there needs to be a phase difference in this uh, in this decay matrix because that will that will give us what uh, that will give us a way to differentiate between the particle and antiparticle states. So with such a Hamiltonian, is you know it is straightforward to see that uh, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are not the particle and antiparticle eigenstates; they are a superposition of the particle and antiparticle eigenstates. And this is a situation where the mass eigenstates are not your interaction eigenstates, which then cause oscillations. What will happen is, uh, as time goes by, or uh, when you think about the time evolution of a system, say you have a system where you started with all particles, as time goes by, you will you, some of your particles will decay, some of them will oscillate into antiparticles. So at a later time, you will end up with a particle-antiparticle mixture. The uh, 
very, very qualitatively, uh, you can see that these oscillations, particle antiparticle oscillations in this plot, where x axis is time in some arbitrary units, and uh, the y axis is probability of measuring either or having either a particle state in blue or an antiparticle state in orange. So even if you started with fully particle states, again, as time goes by, you will be populating the antiparticle states. The oscillations here, the oscillation frequency depends on the mass difference between your heavy and light eigenstates or between the, 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 the eigenvalues of your Hamiltonian. And of course, I added the case here. So all my system is decaying away and that exponential decay envelope is just uh, described by one over gamma. There's a very important quantity or parameter involved in these oscillations uh, is the, the, the mass difference or delta M over gamma. If this quantity X is very large, that means your oscillations are too fast. You're oscillating very fast with respect to your decay rate. If, the, if X is very small, the oscillations are very, very slow. So you might even have one or maybe two chances, maybe not even that, before you decay away. And X around one is the, the sweet spot, basically. So it's like a Goldilocks principle. There's a nice sweet spot where you oscillate a few times before you, before you decay. <clears throat> the CP violation in, these, um, in the system is described through the difference between probability of a particle and antiparticle decaying into a final state F versus decaying into the complex conjugate final state F bar. So this is uh, here uh, shown by this quantity epsilon. You can calculate this epsilon given your um, effective Lagrangian in more detail, but also for um, approximately it goes like it's proportional to X times R. So the ratio of the coupling constant times your sign of the phase in your system. Of course, the, the CP violating phase is zero. There's no CP violation. So, so it's also very, um, very um, straight to see, straightforward to see here. And again, X is, so it goes like X over one plus X square. And this is just a plot of um, uh, this quantity epsilon. The solid line is the exact calculation through this integral, and the, the dashed lines are is this uh, is this approximation for uh, for certain values of r and sine sine phi. <clears throat> but one important thing here to observe is that the CP violating uh, violating parameter or CP violation parameter is maximized maximized for x equals uh, x around one or x equals to one. So again, this is showing you the importance of this parameter x delta m over gamma to maximize CP relation in this system. The, the oscillations in the early universe, though, are uh, actually a bit different than oscillations happening in, in vacuum. And they are also a bit more complicated. So what is happening in the early universe is well, a lot of things. A lot of things are happening in the early universe. So first of all, these particles and antiparticles, they, they, these, these new fermions and antifermions, they were produced at some point after the Big Bang, probably together with all the other standard model particles, right? So their you know, in, inflation era ended, maybe in proton decayed, or you know, some other process created everything in the universe. And what's happening afterwards is that the universe expands, and you know, we, we describe the universe's expansion uh, by this by the Hubble rate. And on the x-axis, um, I'm showing uh, this quantity mass over temperature. And here, mass is the mass of these fermions. And temperature is the temperature of the universe. As this quantity z gets larger, that means time is going forward and the temperature is going down. This is a very uh, this is a nice measure to keep track of things for the for the equations that we will solve later. So z equals one means that the temperature of the universe is equal to the mass of my particle, and that's also a, an important temperature to keep in mind. And for um, well, it's not that important for these um, for these very qualitative plots, but. Uh, I, I am considering a fermion that's about 300 GeV, so you know, around the weak scale, maybe a bit heavier. And I will show with, show many different rates on the same plot. So the first one is the Hubble rate that corresponds to the expansion of the universe. 
the, the, the other important, the second important rate to keep in mind is the decay rate of my particle. So this is, you know, given a Lagrangian, you can calculate this decay rate. It probably depends on the model building and um, the constraints on your model. A particle is, is set to decay out of equilibrium if its decay rate is smaller than the Hubble rate at the temperature is when the temperature is equal to its own mass. So you know, if the particles decay long enough that you cannot produce these particles uh, from the thermal bath anymore, basically, that means that the particles are decaying out of equilibrium. They can only decay, but you cannot produce them. The other, the other uh, direction is not open to you. So there's an out of equilibrium decay. And for this, uh, for this to happen here, I'm showing the decay rate to be 10 to the minus 6 EV, so that it's below the Hubble rate when Z is equal to 1. This is just some, this, these are just some numbers, but they will be related to a, a specific UV complete model that I have in mind. The, the next important quantity to keep in mind is the frequency of oscillations. So actually, oscillations in the early universe they don't happen right away. So you produce your particles, but they don't start oscillating right away. They can only start oscillating when the Hubble rate drops below the, below the oscillation frequency. You can kind of maybe understand this if you think about, you know, being able to complete one oscillation means that you know that oscillation happens in the lifetime of that universe, so that your you know the the Hubble time needs to be long enough to allow for allow for one oscillation. So again, the next thing to keep in mind is this oscillation frequency. And in order to have a large CP relation, we want this 2m over gamma quantity not too far from 1. The other thing that happens in the early universe is that early universe is a very hot and dense plasma, especially if the, the temperature of the universe was very, very large. That means that the universe was very hot and dense. That that also means that our our fermions and antifermions, these new fermions, just like any other you know standard model particle, would be interacting with other things, right? So they will be very close to other particles. So they would be scattering with them. They will be maybe annihilating with each other. And all these interactions actually they they tend to delay oscillations through uh, again a quantum mechanical process called the quantum Zeno effect. Usually oscillations don't start until the the, the uh, scattering and annihilation rates fall below the oscillation frequency. So there is actually a lot of hindrance to uh, against oscillations in the in the early universe. And all of these actually go into this nice Boltzmann equation for the density matrix for our fermions and antifermions. So this uh, Y is a density matrix for psi and psi C. And excuse me. The, the right hand side of this, this equation describes, so the first term describes oscillations. The second term is, is due to scatterings, elastic scatterings. And the third term is due to annihilations between the particles and antiparticles. And the, the, um, the matrix O here is a diagonal matrix. It's either one, one or one minus one, depending on the type of interaction you have for the new particles. And, um, and the type of interactions, well, there are two types of interactions that you need to keep in mind for, uh, for your new physics model. So, and the two type of interactions is, can you tell the difference between a particle and an antiparticle through these interactions? That's basically, if you, you have a symmetry, when you take psi to psi c, if your Lagrangian uh, doesn't change, these kind of interactions are called flavor blind, and flavor here is the flavor of fermion or antifermion. You're either fermion flavored or antifermion flavored. And the other option is when you take psi to psi c, so when you flip your particles to antiparticles, if your Lagrangian flips sign, that means that your interactions are flavor sensitive. Of course, you can also have a mixture of these, right? You need to consider basically one at a time. An example of flavor blind interactions is scalar interactions. So if you have psi psi bar, FF bar, you know, F is some maybe masses fermion can be standard model fermions, and this is a four fermion interaction. So it needs to have some effective, um, uh, effective field theory scale, maybe some lambda. And an example of a flavor sensitive interaction is a vector interaction. And um, again, with some, with some interaction scale lambda here. 
So if you have, oh, sorry, and you can see here in this equation that if you have flavor blind scattering, so if your scattering interactions cannot tell the difference between a particle and antiparticle, the second term actually vanishes. So scatterings don't matter, but annihilations are always on. So annihilations will always, always delay oscillations is one thing I want to mention. And here, um, so, and then the next thing you do is that deciding on what kind of interactions you have, you go ahead and solve those Boltzmann equations. You, it's only a, a four coupled Boltzmann equ equations. They are not hard to solve uh, numerically, sorry. They're hard to solve analytically. They're not that hard to solve numerically, but also you can get an idea by just doing some approximations. And this is an approximate solution for the asymmetry between the size states and size C states. Here, Y is the number density of the state over the entropy density. So this is the abundance of the psi particles, and this is the abundance of the anti-part, anti-psi particles. And this, this asymmetry between the uh, between my new fermions and antifermions is proportional to epsilon. This is my CP violating quantity times the um, times the equilibrium density of my fermions at, at the time when they start oscillating. The Z oscillations marks the temperature when they start oscillating times this exponential decay envelope times the sine square of my um, uh, sine square of um, the mass difference times the Hubble time. So the, the, what you are seeing in this plot is the dashed lines are this approximation and the solid lines are numerical solutions for, uh, for the, the model parameters here. And my model is just an effective, uh, effective Lagrangian. There's actually, I haven't told you the UV complete model yet. So here you have a fermion that is about 300 GeV and the mass difference between the heavy and light states are, uh, or the Majorana masses, sorry, the Majorana mass is 10 to the minus six EV and the decay width is 10 to the minus six EV. One thing you can see here is you know, oscillations being imprinted on the asymmetry, which is kind of C. You can also see when the oscillations start, uh, start uh, when the oscillations start. And here I mark them with this dashed vertical lines. And the other thing to see is that if the scattering cross section is zero, so I'm just you know set uh, arbitrarily the scatterings to to not happen. The oscillations start earlier compared to when you have scatterings because again scatterings, uh, these flavor sensitive scatterings hinder oscillations, so they delay oscillations. So as you increase the scattering cross section, your oscillations start later and later, that also means that you will have less and less asymmetry because your most of your particles or more of your particles have decayed already. And of course, the asymmetry here at the end is going to zero because everything is decaying here. The, while these particles are decaying, we, we want them to produce, uh, produce baryons. So we can also add, again, you know, in our effective Lagrangian, we can say that if particles are specifically decaying into a, a baryon number, a baryon final state, like a proton or a neutron, and that at the end produces a baryon asymmetry, which is again proportional to the CP violating quantity epsilon. And we want this baryon, uh, baryon number asymmetry, eta, to be about 10 to the minus 10. So this, num this baryon number density, you can add it to the Boltzmann equations. So you have the four Boltzmann equations for uh, your, coming from your density matrix. And then the, the fifth Boltzmann equation will be, uh, will be this one for delta B. This is the baryon asymmetry. And you know, this Boltzmann equation is very phenomenological. You are saying that the baryon asymmetry is only produced from, uh, from, uh, from the decays of my psi and psi part, psi c particles, and I apologize. I, I don't. I don't think I can describe why what sigma is, but sigma is y psi plus y psi c. So it's a total number of my fermions and antifermions, which are decaying into baryons, which produces a baryon asymmetry. Again, you can solve this. Uh, solve this approximately or numerically. This plot is showing numerical solutions to the five coupled Boltzmann equations for flavor sensitive interactions. Flavor sensitive interactions are more restrictive. So if you if you can produce the baryon symmetry with flavor sensitive interactions, flavor blind interactions will do even better. 
So again, on the x-axis is, uh, is time or this quantity z as mass over temperature. And I took the mass to be, the direct mass to be 300 GeV. And on, uh, on the y-axis is uh, abundances for different, um, for different um, functions. So the green is the total number of my cyan psi C fermions. You know, they start from some equilibrium rate and then they are just decaying. <clears throat> And delta is um, delta is the the asymmetry in the cyan psi C fermions, and delta B in blue is the baryon asymmetry. So again, you are producing some 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 fermion and fermion asymmetry in these new fermions, and then as they decay, that asymmetry is turning into a baryon asymmetry. And here, I specifically started with uh, with initial conditions where delta B is zero at the beginning. So you start from a baryon symmetric universe, and then as these particles oscillate and decay, they, create, they produce baryons. And I specifically produced more baryons than I actually need, right? Eta observed is the observed baryon asymmetry, but that means, you know, that's just to give myself enough uh, enough room to play play with, basically. So if you increase this uh, scheduling cross-section, for example, your baryon number density at the end will be smaller. So this gives you a nice, uh, nice room to play. So you can definitely produce like uh, enough baryon asymmetry, even with, uh, even with, uh, scheduling cross sections of one femtobarn or so. So these are not like not too small, not too small cross sections, which is great. So this is the general idea, and so this is a very generic generic scenario. It's like really not even a model so far. It's just some effect of Lagrangian that will allow for particle antiparticle or fermion antifermion oscillations oscillations with some interactions, right? That will give me a baryon asymmetry. You can you can actually uh, come up with more specific models, which uh, which at the time I was specifically thinking of um, a U1 R symmetric SUSY model. So you want asymmetric SUSY model. So I started working on them when I was a grad student because my advisor and Nelson, who was a great advisor, and we um, we lost her in two thousand nineteen. So I wanted to I wanted to um, just mention her name and put this nice picture of me and her uh, after my thesis defense. Anyway, we started thinking about the U1 asymmetric SUSY for, for different reasons. That at the time, there was, a, there was an asymmetry, a dimuon asymmetry at, I think, at the, at the Tevatron. But anyway, we were thinking about CP relation and getting some asymmetries. And uh, U1 asymmetric SUSY was, uh, was a nice model for that. And then, after I finished, I I um, you know I continued to think about this model. This model is great because in this is basically a supersymmetric model with a with a global U1 symmetry imposed on the supersymmetric sector. So this means that your gay genomes are pseudodirect fermions. And as pseudodirect fermions, they will have both a direct mass and a Majorana mass. The Majorana mass will be proportional to the gravitino mass. And I'm going very, going over very quickly uh, about this because I want to show you the final plots. But anyway, so your gauge nodes, specifically your B nodes, are pseudo direct fermions, and um, oops, sorry, and you can also include baryon number violation in your uh, model through what is called R pair violation, which is also super fun. But you have all the ingredients then. You have pseudodirect fermions, which is again required in this U1 asymmetric models. This is not for Bayern number uh, for Bayern asymmetry. This is already happens in U1 asymmetric SUSD. And then when you include R pair to violation, you have all the ingredients for uh, generating the Bayern asymmetry through Bino anti Bino oscillations. And when you put all of this into your Boltzmann equations, uh, you can see that. In this plot, that we produce the the correct number of baryons, or you can even produce more baryons if your uh, squarks are about you know a few TeV or ten TeV or so. As your squarks get lighter, you have more baryons. As your sorry, you have less baryon asymmetry. As your squarks get uh, heavier, you have more baryon asymmetry. But this is not too bad actually. A few TeV you can you can live with, and we can still have hope that uh, they might be produced at the LHC if supersymmetry is still correct. 
I am not going to, I think I'm running out, out of time. I'm not going to talk too much about this other great model that uses particle antiparticle oscillations. This is again, uh, this is a model that came from uh, Anne's other collaborators and, and her other collaborators, but they actually found a nice new physics model that includes BB bar oscillations in the early universe. So you can produce, or you can, uh, you can have a model where the BB bar oscillations in the early universe happen out of equilibrium, and then B and B bar states decay via baryon number violating processes. And this model can even use just the CKM phase. I told you that the CKM phase is not enough to produce the baryon asymmetry, but that was for a very specific scenario. In this model, you can just use the CKM phase, and you still get you can still get the the Bayern asymmetry. This is this is fantastic, and also not have very nice observable uh, observables that you can search for at B B, B facilities. So um, I highly recommend reading those papers really. And I will I will end here with uh, end here with some uh, work in progress currently. My my master's student Temi and I are looking into using lepton number violation and lepogenesis. Uh, in a similar scenario, and we will eventually incorporate it with a neutrino mass generation model that I worked with my PhD students. So we can maybe explain both neutrino masses and leptogenesis, uh, and maybe dark matter uh, through just the uh, U1R symmetric SUSY. It will be fun. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was very, uh, very uh, interesting. I'm going to have to watch it again to understand all the details. Um, but I mean, there's a few questions there, but maybe I could start with some boring technical questions. <laughs> um, so, okay, so it, your model basically explains, if we go back to page eight, your, your uh, page eight, so yes. we need, we need non-conservation of baryon number, which you've explained via your model, um, which was, which was nice. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm. No, that's a okay. <laughs> thank you. All. Maybe we. No, have... my uh, the bar, the zoom bar is, is what's coming page, page thirty three. So I couldn't see the page numbers. 21, Fifteen, yeah. Yes, here, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we got the Sakharov conditions, right? So I'm going right back to nineteen sixty seven. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the the so firstly the out of equilibrium processes you're talking about. You mentioned that um briefly. Could, could you just say a little bit more about what are the requirements for the out of equilibrium processes that you need? Clearly, it's not just enough, for example, to have an expanding universe, is it? I mean, there's something that we need more. We need a stronger um, uh, breaking of equilibrium than we would get simply from that, right? And which you alluded to a bit later, I believe. Right. So, um, right. So, I think this depends on this. Like, for example, if it's a decay process. Usually, as long as your decay rate is you know long enough, you are long lived enough. Yeah, that happens to be very out of equilibrium. You you will always have. So if you think about the uh, the decay as an exponential process, you will always have the you know some exponentially small probability that you will yeah. still be able to produce these particles, for example. But that's again exponentially suppressed, and this also happens for for example a first order phase transition. Again, there is some. Uh, some processes that will be immediately exponentially suppressed, basically, and that's you know they could happen in the other way, but that probability is very very small. So that's like that's enough usually. But there is there is often some some period where even though you think you are at uh, the equilibrium, there might be enough room that you are actually equilibrating. So usually sometimes you always need to check. So for very rough estimates, it's enough to just compare to Hubble. But for more detailed calculations, you actually need to solve the Boltzmann equations. And you know, for Boltzmann equations, you don't need to assume anything. They just, you know, they give you the the whatever abundance or number density you are you want to calculate, you know, with, with respect to time, right? That you know, that will give you everything basically. Right. For um, what was I gonna say? And and, and yeah, that has I mean, to... you don't need to be in an, uh, in an expanding universe. It just like gives you a gives you a, again an, an idea of you know what kind of race that you need to you need to require okay so there's no so okay so that's not that doesn't mandate then that particular issue doesn't mandate then uh that this has to be a post-inflationary uh phenomenon oh. 
Right. So yeah, if it is during inflation, again, inflation is a very exponential process. So yeah. you will yes. always exponentially like yeah. exponentiate away any estimator that you have. I only know of one paper which um which basically tries to look at if you can produce the asymmetry during inflation and like yeah. if you can still preserve the asymmetry, the conditions are extremely tuned, like extremely, extremely tuned because you're always trying okay. to fight with a with a quantity that's e to the minus 60, basically. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, that's the, that's that one. Um, what else did I have to know? Well, maybe while I'm looking at my questions, we can take some of the questions from the Q&A panel. So Michael Walker asked a question. If baryon, baryon number were to be violated by an instanton process, however unlikely, what would it look like? How would it be distributed? That is a very good question. Um, I don't know. I think it would be, I don't know if it still would be like, you know, bubbles of spatial, like spatially different, and then they will start growing. I don't even know if they will start growing. That's a very good question. I've never thought of this, yeah. Michael. Yeah. I will think of this. <laughs> Mahendra wants to know, can this be related to gravitons? Or perhaps <laughs> related to dark matter, which you made a reference to yes. in the final slide. Uh, right. So, so uh, again, I didn't talk too much about uh, the, 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 mo the model that was not my model, the BB barrel station model. In yeah. that model, they actually decay to this new particle chi, another new particle chi, and then and also protons. And that new particle is a dark, is a dark matter candidate. So what you can do is you can say that the baryon number is actually not violated. Dark matter has some anti-baryon number, basically. So you are dividing the baryon number between our visible sector and the dark sector. And these are, um, this is also called, you know, these are, this is a type of an asymmetric dark matter model. So you can definitely relate the dark matter dense or dark matter to our particle matter, uh, uh, standard model uh, baryon asymmetry, which are super fun. Uh, uh, yeah. Graviton, I actually did not talk about graviton, but the particles I talked about are gravitino, and gravitinos are supersymmetric partners of the graviton. So gravitino is massive. And uh, with my PhD students right now, we are looking at um, a gravitino as a dark matter candidate, which is you know, a bit, you know, uh, in a specific in the specific model that we have so you know the the c1 asymmetric suzy could have basically all of them it could have gravitino as a dark matter candidate mm -hmm. and also explain neutrino masses and and the baryon asymmetry through the vino which is a supersymmetric partners of um of the photon and then mahendra also wanted to know is asymmetry still following principle of least action <laughs> uh so i'm not quite sure um I'm not quite sure what this question means. The uh, we still use the principle of least action yes, when we uh, when we think yeah. about calculating anything with our Lagrangians. Yes, exactly. Yeah, fair um, enough. Okay, good. And then I had a couple of um, more technical things um, yeah. on on page twenty one. That those those gammas there, those gamma functions, they're decay rates there too, are they? You use gamma for decay rate later, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. So these are the these are the decay rates. I see. Yeah. Okay. Great. That seems to. Yeah. Okay. I see. That, that's right. It's really the, the the difference between a decay rate decaying to a final state f and the complex conjugate final state. So you are yeah. decaying to some of them yeah. just a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And then on twenty four, how did you get your? Was that just a guess? The ten to the minus six decay rate. That was just a nice figure that you right. chose for the graph because it worked or. What was, uh, what was the justification so for, this, for that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for this graph, yes, but it is yeah. like a post diction. Okay. <laughs> it goes right. back to the model I have in mind for the Vino, and then for this one, you can actually, you can, you can actually calculate the decay rate, and for okay. you know, for spe specific number uh, quantities for the squark masses, for example, like the you supersymmetric factors of the from... quarks. Yeah. That you can get back to that number. So. Okay, okay, you, you can work backwards from the. Yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then on number 29, have you got a candidate for what would be a reasonable massless fermion? Oh, this is actually, 
<laughs> I mean, nutrients are always there, but I put the masses in parentheses because yes. as long as you are much lighter than the, the parent particle, okay. you All might right. as well be massless. <laughs> so are we talking neutrinos or what are we talking? About? Electrons could be as well. Yeah. Electrons, okay. any right. like the light quarks, like up and down quarks are very, very light. So they, they're yeah. basically so, massless for a 300 oh, BB particle. You know, right there, the quarks, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And no, then, when I and when I give my students this calculation, I told them I tell them to keep the mass, but it's not that important. <laughs> and, and then that so that kind of reminds me that so what's your view of the uh, there's another alternative theory I don't think you mentioned here, which is related to the sterile neutrino, um, and whether or not that decays preferentially to matter rather than antimatter. Um, do you have any opinion about that? about that approach or yeah so for leptogenesis models yeah so like in leptogenesis models you usually in order to explain the neutrino masses you need some like heavier neutrinos so these are the right-handed neutrinos but yeah. you can always also have a very light neutrino and, and a sterile neutrino yeah the the usually so in that business model, you can, of course, produce a baryon asymmetry. And usually what sterile neutrino does is actually it doesn't decay and then it becomes a dark matter candidate or a warm yeah. dark matter candidate. It's yeah. the heavy ones yeah. that that often decay. Yes. Um, so the, the thing that you definitely need is that your particle, you, you need to produce the baryon asymmetry before BBN. So you know whatever is going to decay should have decayed before 1 MeV or so. And if they decay, they can't be dark matter anymore. So you, right. like the same particle cannot be both dark matter and the, the thing that causes the baryon asymmetry, unfortunately. Oh, right. Okay, that's that's a good point, yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Shader. That was a really interesting talk. I think we covered all the questions, so thank you once again. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the seminar, and we'll keep everyone uh, informed about any new uh, seminars that are coming up. Thanks. Thanks, Shader. Thank you very much. Thanks for very the much.